we're trying to figure out which campaigns are feeding which campaign. This is where an agency would still be very, very relevant. If you have a thoughtful person managing these campaigns that can see everything, what I would hope is that thoughtful person goes, okay, I'm not seeing the conversions from Meta, but what am I seeing? 76% of my new traffic is coming from this one Meta campaign. So even though Meta is not showing the conversion, that to me is a high value campaign. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns. This is the show where we share cutting edge strategies, underscoring cutting edge, because this is the cutting edge of cutting edge here today, Cossum. Strategies to help marketing directors, VPs of marketing, CMOs, business owners get more leads and sales and ultimately achieve their vision. And today is so cutting edge. I think this is, I know we've said Chris Mercer is the most important voice in digital marketing, but I think this is the most important presentation in digital most marketing. Most important message. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm combining that message with your presentation here. Uh, yeah. 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 I th- it's interesting because this being the most important presentation, part of the anecdote is what Mercer says. True. It yeah. is true. It's all interrelated. I'm, I'm the disease up. and Mercer's the cure, basically. <laughs> It's great. It's great to see Mercer actually getting, you know, some props at TNC because he, he's just like, time. he's one of these guys that's always been there yeah. and no, he's he never gets the notoriety. Right. And first off, great hair. Right. Like best Beautiful hair in, in digital marketing. Sorry. Uh, I got to right. give him that. No, I mean, no, no. I'm, I'm 100% with you. Yeah. Him, Tom yeah. Breeze, right up there too. A little bit of salt and pepper, but, and then yeah. you're, you're, you're like a bronze medal. Sorry. The, well, here's the thing is Mercer and Breeze worked really hard at it. This was an accident, Ralph. I'll take I'll take a bronze medal for what really is a midlife crisis. Yeah. I, yeah. People came up to me at TNC. They're like, what? Well, you know what's your plan with your hair? Are you going to cut it? Are you going to grow it out? And I'm like, you think that, does this look like a plan to you? This is, yeah. This is just an accident. Yeah. This, this is a guy trying desperately not to turn 40. That's this, what this is. This is a guy that just doesn't want to pay for a haircut. Really? <laughs> That's There's it. so much truth to that, Ralph. <laughs> so you true. have no idea. I know. I've seen the car you drive, you know. The richer I get, the cheaper I get. Because now I have nothing to prove to anybody. I'm like, true. I'm not. I'm not doing that. I love, I I'll love go to that. Costco and I'll like, I used to go to Costco for the free trouts because I couldn't afford to eat. Yeah. And now I go there because I'm like, I wonder how many of these things I can juice before, I, <laughs> yeah. before I'm full. <laughs> <laughs> so my life has gone full circle. Like I'm still eating free food at Costco, but now it's by choice. I love it. I love it. It's, it's a challenge. You know, how much yeah. can you stretch the dollar? Well, yeah. how, we're going to try and figure out how much you can stretch your advertising dollar here today a bit more and give you some more insights into this, what I think should be a 3D model, really. Right. Uh, 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 you know, and I think you're going to be working on that. You said, you know, I think it should be 4D. 4D. I'll add, yeah, I'm going to add smell. You're going to be able to, it'll be three dimensional and then you can, it'll be, it'll be scented. It'll be <laughs> like, a, oh my God, well, it'll be like cinnamon spice. You know, I did, something, yeah. Something like what that. is what does fear smell like? Fear. That's what it'll be. <laughs> well, sweat, buffalo sweat. I don't know. Well, anyway, let's get back into this. It's oddly it's, specific. It's a weird. <laughs> like there's a story there. Ralph. I know. <laughs> yeah. Actually, a quick side story. When I was in college, there was a bar that I went to, and I uh, was named Louis, and they had a shot at Louis, and it was called Buffalo Sweat. That's what it oh, was. Dude, I thought I was going to get a mechanical bowl story. No, nope, was, nope. You know? And you know what it was? It was, you know, when you go out to the bar and like the, you, the bartender has the rag, washes all the shit yep. from the bar and all the it's, crap. That from, rag's never been washed. Never been washed. The, your glass. The, it, the buffalo sweat was squeeze the rag into a shot glass. Oh, and then God. you do the shot. Like, I can't believe I did that when I was like. Not even you 21. You did. How did you not get oh, yeah. dysentery? Oh, you probably God. did. You probably it's still disgusting. have it. Yeah, I was like 19 with a fake ID. So anyway, so that's the, that's the story behind Buffalo Sweat. So we're not going to talk about that anymore here today and discuss our perpetual traffic listener. Let's get back into part two. I'm excited part two. to see where this goes. We're sort of – it's a cliffhanger. A bit. Yeah. You know, you, you've painted this very dark – this very dark present and future of, of digital marketing and attribution just in general, right. which I love uh, yeah. because you know what? None of this is perfect. Like we said in the first time through, we'll obviously we'll talk about this 
quite a bit as you go through it. But yeah. and uh, if you haven't listened to part one, you have to listen to part one. You got to listen. Like to you're part wasting two. your time right now. Yeah, we're and and I think you know on our socials, I told my social team, it's like we got to slice this up more than just like three or four different things. Like we're gonna use, we're gonna we're gonna blast you all over the internet on all our I socials. Should be. Yeah. You should be. Should be. The you world and your deserves hair. to hear from me. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you know. You want to be heard from, from your perspective, because you are attention starved and you admit this freely, which I think is sad, very self-aware, yeah. very self-aware. Uh, but yeah, make sure that you do watch part one. It's over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. And yes, all you people that negatively comment and say, why don't you have your YouTubes up at the same time as your podcast? Well, we now sure. do. Yeah. And if we're a day late, you know, just blame Cossum. Will you yep. uh, just, you know, negative comments for him. Now, the point is, is definitely you got to watch this uh, perpetual traffic.com forward slash YouTube. Follow it over there. There, Let's get back into part two uh, with the cliffhanger was that basically all attribution is dead and you can't track anything right now online. And it's a very dark view of the world. So hopefully there's a light at the end of this tunnel here at Cosm. Uh, so take it away. The real quick TLDR on part one, and you have to go back and listen, but just mm -hmm. as a refresher, all traffic is uh, I'm, is represented in the analogy that I'm offering as a cube. And the cube is made up of uh, a 10 by 10 X and Y axis. The Y axis is the funnel top to bottom. The X axis is every potential ad channel uh, left to right. And starting on the left is impression and moving to the right is click. And then the Z axis is time. So that becomes 10 by 10 by 10. So you have a thousand cubes and roughly speaking, you can see one. You can see the extreme bottom, extreme right, extreme front. Right. You can see the bottom of the funnel, the the last click, the most recent. That's all you can see. Yep. And uh, we started with some examples, and I've got a few more that I think are really poignant. Mm -hmm. So here's my fancy dancy slide deck that mm -hmm. I did myself, Ralph. I do. You know, that's actually not true. My EA made my slide deck, and then I go through and I... I uh, I cosify it. Edit. Cos yeah. Cos cosify it? Is that means a I verb? ruin it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> dude, it bugs me because when I'm, when I'm speaking places, TNC is like, oh, you know, you're speaking in January. We need your deck by October. Right. And I'm like, nothing I give you in October is going to be relevant at all. So, and I swear to God, this is true. I just have him create, I take my last deck, <laughs> change the title, and I send them an old deck. Yeah. And then later when it gets closer to time, I'm like, hey, by the way, I made some tweaks. And then I send them the real new deck. It's so true. I did the exact same thing. Literally, yeah, like you, you can see, like, my, I think my presentation was on the first day, like yours was, and you can see in the drive. The timestamp. Like, <laughs> the timestamp yeah. of when it was uploaded. It's like 20 minutes before my presentation. So anyway, yeah. I got you. Dude, I appreciate them being organized. But if I gave a talk that I wrote in October, I wouldn't be TNC. Like you have to give people cutting edge stuff. A hundred percent. hundred percent. So here we are. If you're not watching on YouTube, you can go to perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. And what we're looking at here is another example of how attribution doesn't exist. Ralph, do you does this nomenclature look familiar to you if you can see past the block? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. This is a tier 11 campaign. Wow. Here's what's really interesting. That. This is a tier 11 meta campaign that shows a losing Facebook campaign. So we're dealing with one of your clients. I'm the Google agency. Mm -hmm. You're the meta agency. We're the losers. And you're the winners. Yeah, we're, you're the losers, we're the winners. And we're like, look at us, we're so smart. Tier 11 sucks. Look mm -hmm. at their losing ass campaign. You're spending six grand. You're, you're, you've got 0.9 transactions. This isn't ROAS, by the way. This is number of transactions. You spent $6,000 and you got not even one full transaction. So you know what the client did here? I don't know if you know this story because you have too many clients. There's no way you can watch them all. Yeah. Your client turned this campaign off. Oh. Yes. Ouch. Here's what's really interesting. This campaign, this losing campaign, when they turned it off, it tanked everything. All Google campaigns instantly just plummet. And what we go to find out is the losing Facebook campaign was responsible for 76% of all new traffic. Wow. So this losing campaign that, and, and you notice I'm not in meta, I'm in North Beam. Yeah. So I, we know Meta can't track. Fine. Here's my fancy attribution tool. Yep. And my fancy attribution tool shows this This is responsible. This one campaign is responsible set for 76% of all new visits. And what they did when they turned it off, much to our dismay, and against y'all's recommendations, 
is they tanked all new traffic and now Google's got nothing to to bottom feed off of. Yep. And it happens over and over and over again. Here's another example. Here's a question that I asked from stage mm -hmm. is who clicks on TikTok? And, and, and I had all the TikTok users raise their hand and, you know, it was, it was about half the room in both instances. Driven might have been a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And and then the question becomes, well, do you click? And the answer is no, I scroll. Yeah. Nobody clicks on TikTok. Yeah. Well, if you're looking at TikTok from an attribution perspective, here we are back in North Beam. And the attribution model, of course, is click only because there's no way to model TikTok views. How could you possibly do that? Watch watch somebody the next time you, you, you're around somebody who uses TikTok. Watch them scroll through TikTok. Nothing has ever happened faster in the history of mankind. Yeah. I'm surprised people's thumbs move that fast. It's just, you know you what have, I mean? Like it's if unbelievable. You have kids, I find this is fascinating. My my kid, my, especially my oldest, like when he's home, Instagram and TikTok, and he like sits on the on the floor in front of our TV, our connected TV, and I'm on the couch and he's on the floor, and I see how he. It's exactly what you talk about. Dude, it's not flip, it's flip, so flip, fast. Flip, I'm like, how stop. do you flip, flip, take flip, the information? Yep. Yeah. I don't even doing. know what to stop at. Like, it's just, it's dear goodness. They're so fast. And so you'd never be able to attribute impressions. Yep. There's no such thing as a click. Stopping is the equivalent of a click in TikTok. It's like, oh, I stopped and I saw information. Right. So here's the media efficiency ratio of a TikTok ad being attributed at 0.65, $60,000 spend with a MER of 0.65. And yet when you turn off TikTok, the whole thing goes to hell in a handbasket. That client's entire acquisition was TikTok. Here's another example. Hmm. This gets really interesting. This is, again, this isn't in app Google. This is North Beam. This is attribution. You'll notice if you're watching at the screen, I have two columns. I have revenue based off of first touch, according to North Beam, and revenue based off of last touch, according to North Beam, only in Google. Yep. So we're not talking about the problem between matching between Google and Facebook over time with multiple channels, multi funnel. This is just Google. And Google can agree on nothing. You have a campaign that from a first touch perspective, if you attribute revenue to first touch, it's 480 grand. If you attribute it to last touch, it's 530. Here's another one from 35K to 26K. Here's another one from 20 to 10 for to 11 cuts in half. So some of them, the first one I mentioned from 480 to 530, there's 50 grand top side that goes to last touch. But then the last one I just mentioned, it's double first touch. Uh, here's one 17 to 14. Here's one 11 to five. The point here being... Even when you're in app, even when you're in a silo, even when you're in a closed ecosystem, the way you look at the data changes massively, massively as you start to modify the attribution discussion. And this is, you know, first and last touch is such a misnomer because Google can't see the first touch. This should say first touch that we can track and last touch that we can track because we're looking right. at the last cube on the rubik's cube not first first touch it's the no. first touch we can track that's a, actually i've never heard anyone say that before that's profound first <laughs> touch we can track which by the way is probably one of the very last touches in their sales cycle probably the first touch we can track is probably their 498th touch it's the second to last cube on the rubik's cube front right. facing Right. Dude, we should Maybe. start calling first touch attribution, second to last touch attribution. <laughs> that but that's wild. the thing is all these data-driven marketers are like, oh, we're making decisions based off of the first touch attribution. And this is clearly the acquisition campaign. No, it isn't. Shut up, nerd. You right. do not know what you're saying. Right. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to your client. You're lying to your team. This is a really interesting example. This is an example we figured out by accident. One of our clients was running Meta. Again, here we are. And dude, you know what's so funny is when I started being a co-host of Perpetual Traffic, all I did was shit on Meta. Right. All, it wasn't even called Meta at the time. And I still hate Zuckerberg, by the way. I still think he's a petrol <laughs> child thief. I still, like, I'm not off that train. But it's crazy how complicit I was in this lie. Yep. Because I saw like, oh, look, Google outperforms Facebook all the damn time. I'm I'm the best, blah, 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 blah. But then here it's I am. to sound like Alaric Heck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, YouTube ads. It's fine. I talked to Alric this morning. Um, super smart guy. He's he's launching an agency. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that yet. Uh oh. But there you go, Alric. Some free publicity for you. Or I'm so sorry that I let the cat out of the bag. Um, it's supposed to be secret, but yeah, hey, that's all right. Nobody's listening yeah. to this show. Nobody. We only get three hundred thousand dollars a month. It's no big deal. Yeah. No big deal. Um. Here's a client whose ads were disapproved by Meta, and you can see a little graph on the screen, and you can see the inflection point where the ads were disapproved. And when the ads were disapproved, we had uh, 25 conversions in a week period, 
and eight of those were what's called engaged view conversions. That means that they watched enough of the YouTube ad for Google to attribute the conversion to the YouTube view. It's not a click, it's an engaged view conversion. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself like, okay, well, fine. How many engaged view conversions could Meta possibly be responsible for? Here's what's really interesting. Zoom out on that timeline, and you can see that the engaged view conversions, if I zoom out just a month, so I went from looking at the week that it was disapproved to the two months, all of October, all of November, and engaged view conversions make up twice the total conversions. So out of 360 conversions, 140 are clicks, 220 are engaged views. And what we realized was Meta's ads were cooperating and cooperating with YouTube. And dude, that to me is crazy. The fact that, because I, I always, like if you say like Meta goes to last click, branded search in Google, makes all the sense in the world. Somebody sees a meta ad, searches for you, clicks. But for meta ads to translate into engaged view YouTube conversions, and this is an outbound, look at the nomenclature, YouTube outbound contractors. Nobody even thinks like that. How could you? It doesn't yeah. make any it doesn't make it doesn't sense. make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And yet here we are, meta, the minute meta, we were getting double the conversions from click to engage view. Engage view is doubling the conversions uh, that clicks is getting meta gets shut off and then engaged views worth half. So this is, it just goes to speak to the fact that it's so incestuous. There's no such thing as attribution. Here's things are going to get crazier, Ralph. You ready for things to get crazier? This is unfreaking believable. This blows my mind. Here's how bad Google's internal tracking and attribution is. Now we know Meta's tracking sucks. Meta is a disembodied entity. It's nothing but an app. It has no browser, no device, no link to the mothership, right? It's incumbent. It, it's reliant on whatever it is that you're traveling through to give it the data. And Google's not like that. 28-day attribution window, right. And 28 days kind. It's really seven, right? With 28, they kind of mildly expanded and semi-opaque. Mostly seven, yeah. Google, on the other hand, has browsers, has devices, uh, is the largest operating system in the world with Android, has a whole myriad of an ecosystem, has a search engine, has the way to triangulate data. So you think like, oh, well, Google has way better attribution. Check this out. This is a client of ours that has 1.9 million website visitors in, uh, this is a two-month period. Two-month period, yep. Okay, so two million website visitors in a two-month period. So a million a we month. Google, sorry? Notice how I did that math quickly. A two-month period, two million visitors, a million a month. You're a savant. We're going to Vegas. You and I are. We're counting cards. We're going to count some cards. Yeah, we're going to do it. So, okay. Keep, we keep the flow to going. An audience. I'm, I'm interrupting the flow here, but go, go No, ahead. it's great, dude. It, yeah. it, it, it's, it softens the monotony of my voice. The listeners <laughs> are like, oh, thank God. Somebody who's not mildly autistic yeah, is talking now. And loves to hear interpret. his own voice, people are saying. Right <sighs> oh. um, that wasn't a autism bash by the way i really am mildly autistic for anybody who's about to call the aclu yeah i know you are okay it's, yeah I, i'm sure that's obvious we're all on the spectrum somehow i'm so, sure i just didn't want to be accused of a hate crime 100 percent. yeah i'm allowed to say it so back to the back so to the show. two million viewers in 60 days we said hey google create an audience for us of, of all those users google matches 321,000 out of 2 million for those of you that are bad at math that's 17 percent. i know because i used a calculator Google is able to match 17%. Now you think, okay, well, fine, that's top of funnel. It's super broad. Let's dive deeper. Uh, 654,000 website purchases in a one-year period. 654,000. This is now, this is last click, converted users with first-party data that landed on my thank you page. 654,000 customers paid me money, gave me names, addresses, Logged in, blah, 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 blah. 654,000 in a 365 day period. Zoom out to 540 days with Google and say, create me an audience of all my converters. Google's able to match 82,000. They match 12.5%. Okay, devil's advocate. Couldn't they be repeat purchasers? Not with this client, but in theory, yes. Okay, so there is that. But not with this client. This is no, like a one-time client. Purchase. This isn't a consumable client. This is okay. a one-off client, and I can't tell you what they are. But I can tell you, like, you'd only ever buy one fancy patio chair, right? Maybe somebody's buying a second one. This is kind of a client like that. Like what I'm saying, you'd ever you'd only buy one. For, you know, like uh, cushions. 
Maybe All right, we'll covers. take my 654,000, cut it in half. All right. And Google is still only matching 24% of converted first party data users. So this what this means is like if you're thinking, "Oh, we're using exclude campaigns." Right. Exclusions. Or we're going to, yeah. yeah. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. There can be no such thing because Google can't even match its own damn data. Here's what this means. There's no audience exclusions. You can't exclude website visitors, which means you can't do real prospecting campaigns. You can't exclude converters, which means you can't do remarketing to like, you know, if people are saying like, oh, we've got a, a, a shopping cart abandonment campaign. But you do kind of, but not really. It's like, it's, it's, it's all, everything's broad. Everything's opaque. You can't exclude existing customers, which means you can't do ex acquisition campaigns. You can't do remarketing to cold traffic only. You can't do cart abandonment. You can't do customer reactivation. You can't do behavioral targeting. You can't do dynamic remarketing, targeting based on interest-based category, targeting based on phase. Now, when I say you can't do that, you can, but it's broad and it and what people think is oh I, i'm getting it 80 percent right with 20 percent margin for error no you're getting it 12.5 percent right per the data i just gave you or 17 percent right with 87 percent margin of error or 83 percent margin of error right most of the audience that you see in these targeted campaigns are in the gray most of what you get is, is is non visible, and that's the point of the Rubik's cube. We need to flip everybody's par paradigm upside down. Everybody thinks it's like an iceberg. It, the tip that you can see is the smallest part, right. but everybody thinks you can see the majority of the data. You can't. You can't. You yeah. can't. And and we have to advertise with that understanding. We have to advertise with that understanding. So we need to. We, we, oh, sorry. Go ahead. You're going to say. I'm not interrupting. I'm just adding a question here because yeah. I know you're on a roll, and it's it's. it's this is a roll. This is a roll and a half. The point is, is of all the platforms, you would figure just Google playing the, the devil's advocate, like let's, yeah. even though I know this is not the case, you would think that Google would be able to capture all of that because they basically own the internet. So I have a theory there. I so actually why? think that Google, Google Give me can. your example. Like, like I have an understanding as to why, but like why is that match rate so low? And obviously- We've talked to John Moran about this many, 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 many times. And the first thing that we always do whenever we take over a Facebook campaign, hey, a new customer acquisition, throw in exclusions, you know, website visitors, previous customers, leads, anyone who's interacted with your website, page views, you name it. Still, there's obviously there's going to be ones that get through that net, but that's Facebook. On Google, you would think that it would be the opposite. It would be the the flip the absolute opposite would be the case so why is that dude google it used to be so damn close to perfect ralph it was scary you know we've heard stories there's the there's the fun anecdote that makes the rounds about the guy who messed with his roommate and started advertising to him with like really specific things that you know like could only be applicable to the roommate you know the story i'm talking about oh i used to do this all the time yeah, maybe it's your story. The, the, <laughs> well, dude, the a lot of Facebook advertisers did. But yeah, anyway. the matching and the exclusions that, I mean, even Facebook had it too, but that Google had was like def Department of Defense scary. Yeah. And I think what's happening here, I know for a 100% fact, and I actually can prove this too, which is really interesting, and I can prove it by looking at historic campaigns and showing people what used to be possible. Google has pulled back on what it allows us to see from a targeting perspective and a match perspective. And my theory is, and I think my theory is very sound, by the way, this isn't speculation, it's not conspiracy theory, this would, this would have to be what's true, is Google has made a strategic decision to change its paradigm, its approach, in order to align with what it assumes will be the regulatory environment moving forward. And there's there there are rules here. I work with a gentleman whose name I probably can't use, but he was one of the very top developers in the cryptocurrency world for the second largest cryptocurrency in existence. He was like the dude. And he says the, something to me all the time that I think is so interesting and really worth taking note of if, you, if you're going to be in any regulated environment. He, goes, he said, we can't build to be compliant with the regulation. We have to build to be compliant with the spirit of the regulation mm. because technology moves so much faster than regulation can keep up with. You as the technologist have to intuit 
what is it that the regulator actually wants and means? Because when they go to update this, they're going to have to broad sweep brush and catch up by probably a decade. And in so doing, there's going to be a lot of little nuances that if you're playing in the gray, or even if you're technically compliant, you're the spiritual non-compliance is going to get nailed and you're going to get your legs taken up from under you. Now, if you're a nimble startup, it's okay to play in the gray. If you're Google and you're looking at the next hundred years, which is the way trillion dollar companies should function, and you realize, okay, GDPR, California legislation, ADA compliance, sure. WC3 standards, iOS 14 updates. So it's not just, it's not just legislation from governments and municipalities, it's also the way that other corporations are going to interact with each other. For us to exist in that ecosystem, we cannot rely on the way that we used to do tracking, modeling, attribution, et cetera. And Google rolled out this thing. They, they claim to have sunset it. I don't believe this is conspiracy theory. Now, I don't believe for a fraction of a second that it's actually been sunset. I think it's been renamed and then just put behind an iron curtain. But Google created something called Flock, which is federated learning of cohorts. Right. And it was brilliant. It was brilliant, Ralph, what they did. Instead of tracking users on a one-to-one -one basis, they put users into clouds yep. that were indicative of who that user is demographically and psychographically. And then they provided you data on the cloud instead of on the user. Right. And I'm not using cloud in the cloud data term. I'm using cloud in like the evaporated water term. So right. Um, you would have these these foggy impressions of big who was coming to your site and what people. they were doing, right? Yeah, without actually tracking Users. that person. Now, right. it was it was too far ahead of its time. And Google, to their credit, they actually gave us a lot of information on it, and people freaked out, myself included, because because at the time we didn't need to do that. So it was like, dude, why are you taking all this shit away from us? And what you realize now is, oh, you were getting out ahead of what was coming. So I think they're still basically following that script, that playbook. I just don't think they're being as open as they were when they gave you know all the white papers on the federated learning co cohorts out. Mm. And so when Google has an inability to match on a one-to-one -one basis the way that they have, I mean, dude, our Google match rate in some instances historically was like 80, 90%. Yeah. So how can they drop from 80 to 90% to 12 to 15% when they didn't get boobopped by the iOS 14 update? They, mm. it, that would make no impact on them. Mm. They have to have had a change in developmental paradigm and approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that that change is meant to align with what they know is coming from a regulatory standpoint and what they know is coming from a, you know, it's it's the, the, the technological space race and cold war between all of these corporations that are withholding data from each other. It, even though I have the data right now today, if I, if I don't have it tomorrow, how can I function? And also I need to prepare my advertisers for not having that. Right. So I think it's it's brilliant strategically yeah. to just get out ahead of it and act as if, and that would be my, I'd love, you know, I'm sure when I speak, Google developers just laugh because they're like, this all, that's all horseshit. Who the hell knows? But that from the outside looking in, that's my best guess. And I've got more access to more data than anybody. You know, there are very few people in the world. Dude, I, I mean, how many, what would you guess? There, there has to be less than a thousand people on the planet that get to see as many Google ads accounts as I do. And half of those work at Google. <laughs> So, you know, I, and I've got the time to sit around and think about that shit. So this is, this is my best guess. We'll see how I do. It, when, when you think about it, these are, we're talking about multi-billion dollar companies. And right. at the end of the day, they are beholden to their stockholders and to their stock price. And they are not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize that unto itself. So I always sort of re recall that when I think about it, and. It, Google is one of those interesting companies where it's do no evil. I don't even know if they even s still say that, but that's what the company was founded on. I haven't heard that in quite some time. Yeah. They are I think in, it's do no evil publicly. Do no evil publicly. Okay. Yeah. Do wow. no public evil. But the point is, is that they, and I know we've talked about this many times in perpetual traffic, is that they sat back while... Zuckerberg and Facebook at that point in time before it was meta took all the arrows in front of Congress brilliant, brilliant, and brilliant, brilliant. it was a brilliant, brilliant move. And, but in reality, Google's really 1400 times smarter than Facebook as far as what it knows about its users. And we've done well, the math before. And worse in worse. terms of being an offender like when when congress when the geriatric morons were interviewing zuckerberg like how could you do this like google you set up my wi-fi <laughs> yeah dude i mean they've got a bloody knife a bloody axe and you know yeah. two gloves that don't fit like just kind of trying to hide from the fact that 
if you want to talk about data exposure and targeting, it's like, oh, dear God, oh my the number God. of people and the amount of oh. data that they had it made available versus what Zuckerberg was stupid in the way that he did it. It was just unsophisticated. I know. So it made it look obvious. But Google was the primary offender and never got not I want to say never got caught, but like never got called out. Well, he got caught with his pants down on the on the Cambridge Analytica yeah. scandal. And by the way, Cambridge Analytica was not the only one that did that. No, they're right. just the biggest that got caught. The biggest it was that a whistleblower. Got and anytime right. there's a whistleblower, that's a thing too, because that's such a good tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Everybody, every app company was doing that no. at that point in time. And then share it if you don't recall what it is, we'll leave links in the show notes. We did so many shows on this. But anyway, the point is is that we're not going to rehash the Cambridge Analytica story, but the point is is that Google is that's the type of thing of the, that leads to this decision. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. They're like, I don't want that to happen to us. So right. we are going to blind you to the data and have a 17% match rate or 14% match rate or whatever it happens to be. And the, the funny thing is, is that like, if you really try to use exclusions and your main goal is new customer acquisition on Google unto itself as just a specific platform where I, I'm going to go out and find brand new customers. You, you cannot in any way, shape, or form, target just new customers, especially if you have a viable business. It's my next slide, Ralph. Oh, here's what's really interesting. So Lead Performance in. Max has a new customer only checkbox. If you check that box, on average, Pmax takes 80% of your old customers and new customers. Now, notice the continuity in my numbers. This is a major deal. Like, oh, we, dude, it's huge. I it's, remember, it's, when this first came out, we were so excited about this. Um, and I, I did John actually, on this multiple times. You guys became like the Performance Max agency of record. Like, this yeah. was a big deal, but now it's a farce. It's a 100% farce. If, if you look at the, the continuity of my numbers, Pmax takes 80% of your old customers as new customers, okay? Look at the last two examples I showed you 12% match, 17% match. So 80% new, those are the people that aren't being matched. That's the fog. That's the gray. That's the fog. So if you tell Google, I only want new customers, 80% of the people are your actually older existing customers. That's because you're getting somewhere sub 20% match. It's unfreaking believable. So, so, so. All right. The question people are asking now, like, all right, dude, fine. Chicken little, the sky is falling. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you. What is it? Pompeii? Like... <laughs> We're all going to get buried in ash. That's right. Vesuvius mm -hmm. is, yeah. is flowing. Lava flows are coming at you. What do you do now? What do you do? And what's really interesting is the, the, the answers are we return to the basics, but we have to do so in intentional ways. And the first thing that I'll say is if you're only running singular channels, and I don't just mean just running Meta and Google, like you should be running every applicable channel to your audience. Period, full stop. You should be running every single possible. And dude, this is where I think people should be going back to traditional advertising. Like uh, I, I've mentioned this a couple of times. I had the highest performing real estate investment campaign on the planet for seven years. You know what was really interesting is when we started our real estate investment lead generation agency, nobody was using Google and I was minting money. By the time we ended, flash forward, you know, across, cascade that across seven years, the entire market had shifted to Google. I sold the agency because the the real estate market started to turn, and my the little tool on my tool belt only works in a seller's market or in a buyer's market. But towards the end, when we were talking to our clients, Google wasn't their primary lead acquisition tool. It was direct mail, and it's because everybody used to use direct mail. When they all transitioned to Google, they took all their money out of direct mail and they put it into Google, but they did it all at once. So then direct mail became a blue ocean. I think the whole world needs to start looking at those blue oceans. Look at billboards, direct mail, door knockers, bandit signs, cold calling, email, outreach, radio, television, newspaper. And then look at some of the more obscure programmatic display, outbound, you know, whatever, YouTube, AdRoll, Taboola, Outbrain, Reddit, um, organic. Like give yourself the opportunity to be placed in a multi-channel atmosphere ecosystem because each of those channels is going to feed the other. So here are the things that you need to do. You have to run, and, and Ralph, to your credit, you have been saying this for as long as I've been listening to Perpetual Traffic, and you've been saying this longer and harder than anybody I've ever known. And we could probably go back, you know, six years and find an episode where you champion this narrative you have to run full funnel traffic. 
So remember, we have our X, our Y, and our Z axis. The Y axis is the funnel. And people who aren't running top of funnel campaigns, brand awareness campaigns, prospecting campaigns, um, you know, make people problem aware, make people solution aware. You have to run full funnel traffic. That's number one. That's your y-axis. Then you have to run across all applicable channels. That's your x-axis. Then you have to run for an extended period of time. That's your z-axis. Mm -hmm. And to be frank, that's the answer. You take a very relevant message put it in front of a very relevant audience across the entire funnel, across all applicable channels, across a protracted period of time. And guess what happens? You fill the Rubik's cube, right? You can't see what's happening, which is the thing that terrifies all of us. So we don't want to spend money where we can't see. Mm -hmm. But if you only spend money on that last cube, and, and the analogy that was given to me that I think we, we chose on the last episode was the world's inventory of traffic can be likened to corn and traffic that buys is popcorn. Mm -hmm. And all of us, every business and every industry has decided to just start paying for instant pop popcorn because that's the easiest and the fastest. Mm -hmm. But in so doing, people stopped planting corn. And now we've run out of cold traffic aware traffic, like we need to go and, and plant more corn and that's the awareness building, that's the branded building. So you have to go full funnel, multi-channel, protracted period of time, X, Y, Z. Uh, while you're doing that, you have to establish at least three measurement sources, preferably more. So that would be in-app, take what Google and Facebook are telling you, know that it's a lie, but you still need to look at it. Sure. GA4 is surprisingly adept at broader tracking. And Chris Mercer has some amazing resources over at Measure Marketing, many of them free, by the way. Yeah. And then whatever is first party for you. So Shopify, your CRM, those are your three sources. Uh, extra credit if you're using attribution software. Um, I hate Hyros. It's last click UTM based. It's garbage. I don't care that that neck tattoo guy might stab me in the face. Uh, I like, do he I apparently picked a fight with somebody on stage. Have you heard that story? That wouldn't surprise me. I don't want to get sued for libel. So I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> but surprise either me. way, it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> I know I like Scott the, DeGrassier wants to take him on. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Uh, I'm very fragile. I, I don't want to fist fight yeah, oh, break Instagram influencer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Plus, he's, he's got a Ferrari in the background when he records his videos. So, well, you have a, a Honda Accord from like 1972. So, it's a prelude. Oh, it's a prelude. prelude. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm Accord. saying. No, but if you if you record a video and you have a Ferrari in the background, like you just care way too much about your image, and I don't want to fight you because it means more to you than it's true. Me. Even the, even if it is rented, but that's okay. That is 100 percent a Toro <laughs> Ferrari. Yeah, I want to see that. I want to see that. And if it's not, I actually think you're dumber. Right. Anyway, Rent attribution again. software. Wicked Reports yep. or North Beam. Those are the two that we like and use. Yep. Um, I'm sure there are others out there that exist, but those are the two that I, and here's the other thing is we've played with a lot of them. Um, all of them. Here's the, all of them. Yeah. Dude, there's not an attribution software I know of that we haven't tested thoroughly. There's one, there's so, a couple that just keep coming on the market that I have not. And, and then I'll call scott and be like who the hell are these people like ah they're a knockoff of this that you yeah know, no dude, john tests every damn thing because we, yeah. we're so desperate for something that works um and then sure. the last point about what to do is measure success using cash in cash out models over time this is media efficiency ratio media mix modeling or or return on investment mer mmm or roi here's what's really interesting about mer mmm and roi in my very layman non-college graduate opinion they're the same damn thing Whatever, whatever <laughs> academic wants to step in and be like, well, actually, technically, media efficiency ratio doesn't take into consideration OPEX. Like, shut up. It's how much I put money in the magic box and then money came out of the magic box. And that's MER, MMM, and ROI. Yep. And depending on how you want to calculate it for yourself, I do not care. But that's how you should be tracking. And you should be tracking over time. This is the, maybe the, the last point that I'll make again. Marketers have the bad habit of looking at things in 30-day cycles. Of course. There's no business in the world that I can think of that operates in clean 30-day cycles. We have to look over time, and that over time means zoom out. 
Um, a couple of notes just because people are going to want this. These are campaign pairings that we know work really well. Google Standard Shopping and Meta, Meta Advantage Plus. This is a writer downer, people. Phenomenal pairing. Yeah, this is the hack. I want the this hack. hack. The tactic. The, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is where everybody like puts their phone up and screenshots yeah. the screen. Yeah, Which that, pisses me off because none of your other I slides said, were screenshotted, by the way. I, still I know. Only this one. I know. It was just a bunch of deer in headlights, dude. It was like, I can't believe they haven't pulled him off stage yet. Why? <sighs> Why has he not been assassinated? Why is he talking so fast? Because yeah. <laughs> I thought Why I had 45 so, minutes when they so gave me 30. <laughs> Why yeah. is he so angry? Yeah. Um, All right. So, shopping and Meta Advantage Plus. Okay. Google Standard Great. Shopping plus Meta Advantage Plus is option yep. one. Got it. Uh, prospecting and Meta plus bottom of the funnel search in Google. Bottom of the funnel doesn't just mean your brand, by the way. It, it is brand, but it's also product names, buying terms. It's 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 intent based terms. Something very closely or loosely affiliated with your product. Yeah, and then prospecting and Meta and YouTube. <laughs> believe it or not, and I don't know how or why that really functions, but it functions amazingly well. And I sh I showed you the data. That's a wild one. Right Isn't that down. nuts? Yeah. See, I uh, learned something new here. That's one that I have to actually even look at even further. Just go play with it. Well, John taught me that. Go talk yeah. to John. Oh, wow. Um, we should have him on. Dude, some of the shit he's doing is just crazy. I know. Crazy, he's crazy. an insane madman who I love. For, yeah. He's like you know. the Andy Warhol of traffic. Like, you're like, you, when you hear him talk, you're like, none of this can be true. And then he, whatever, the, whatever comes out is like magic. And you're like, wow. He's the Stephen Hawking of traffic, I think. I, yeah, you know, I don't know. Like, he's more mobile. <laughs> he's more mobile. <laughs> Talking about his brain, not like yeah, you know, him, him in a wheelchair. Yeah. You know, anyway. That said, don't take my standard campaigns and say like, oh, this is everything. Look at every business is going to be different. Find the campaigns that work for you. Uh, and then there's a bunch of stuff that I gave away only at my mastermind that I don't think we need to get into. Hmm. I guess you have um, to join <laughs> to get all yeah. of those. Well, guys. I can tell you. Some of it is just client specific, so I won't yeah. dive too, too deep. But um, here, the broad strokes are run non-conversion campaigns. Yep. And people freak out when I tell them this. Run campaigns. And you know what's so funny too, dude? Egg on my face. I remember doing talks where I'd say, the biggest mistake I see in uh, ad campaigns is they don't have conversion tracking set up properly. And here I am now telling people, run campaigns without conversion tracking. But here's why. You don't want Meta and Google to know when somebody converts. Because then they start to optimize for it. And when they start to optimize for it, they start to commoditize your traffic and you pay more. So if you're running a relevant message to a relevant audience, but they can't see who's converting, you'll notice that your costs actually stay static instead of instead of suddenly doubling down on, oh, that's the prospect and now everything's going to get more expensive. Mm -hmm. So run non-conversion campaigns, run campaigns without goals, run campaigns without audiences. What Meta and Google both do really, really, really well is they'll automatically optimize campaigns for engagement. Mm -hmm. So for instance, who's watching your videos? Mm -hmm. So if you've, got, if you've got copy or ads that intrinsically qualify an audience, then run no audience targeting and just let Meta and Google figure out who's engaging with your ads. And then again, if there's no conversion on the other end of that, you get super cheap traffic that's, that's highly converting. Remember, you can also um, capture those audiences in videos too. In app, that's exactly right. Which and is videos really, tend to be the best performing ads for that type of intrinsic qualification. In most cases, yeah, most cases. I mean, I, I have a couple of case studies where it was not, <laughs> but you know that engagement is actually now a video view or percentage of engagement that's then retargeted. You know whether or not that's actual true data, I have to sort of figure that it's in app, so it's going to be fairly accurate. But it, let me let me just pose this as our final question here because I know we're running out of time. Is uh, I'm running a campaign and I've got my campaign that is on Facebook that looks like a loser, mm. right? Whether I'm using it in third party attribution software or not. And I had this question posed to me at that CEO group that I belong to. It's like, I just shut off all those campaigns to see where the holes were. Do you recommend people doing that? Like it did happen in some of your examples here over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. Is that the only way to say, no, oh, think, Facebook is actually, you know, feeding my bottom of funnel, you know, high intense search based campaigns or my brand search campaigns or, or YouTube is feeding, you know, at the top by just sh plain shutting it off. Like, is that, it seems like a radical solution to sort all this out. Am I just off the rails here? If we're playing scientific method. I think that's probably the only way to know definitively 
where the joints are. So right. if you're like, you know, the head bone is connected to the knee bone or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to figure out which campaigns are feeding which campaigns, by shutting one off, you can see where the cascading impacts are. But if you have a really thoughtful, and this is where media buyers are still really relevant. This is where an agency would still be very, very relevant. Right. If you have a thoughtful person managing these campaigns that can see everything, what I would hope is that thoughtful person goes, okay, I'm not seeing the conversions from Meta, but what am I seeing? In the example that I shared in the presentation, 76% of my new traffic is coming from this one Meta campaign. So even though Meta is not showing the conversion, that to me is a high value campaign. Right. Am I seeing views? Am I seeing engagement? And dude, what's my CTR? Am I seeing clicks? So don't use vanity metrics. You can't eat vanity metrics, but you can use vanity metrics to give you a sense as to the health of a campaign. Mm. And as long as we understand that in the Rubik's cube, I can only see that last cube, you can start to mentally model. Well, if this campaign was performing, it would be performing here. And I know I don't have visibility to where here is. Mm -hmm. So it's a safe assumption that this campaign is participating in the success of the overarching marketing mix earlier than I'm able to track. Mm -hmm. And in, in a more sophisticated fashion, what if I ratchet spend up a little bit, what happens? Mm -hmm. What if I ratchet spend down a little bit, what happens? And most importantly, when does it happen? Because it's not gonna be in 30 days. Mm -hmm. Maybe you ratchet spend up and then the impact you see is seven months later. True. This is where the conversation gets really interesting. Or seven weeks later. This is Do the farming corn weeks? analogy. Cause yeah. you know. We're not, we're not driving a race car, we're sailing a boat. Right. It's like, I'm going to turn a little bit, I'm going to tweak a little bit, and we're going to see how things function. And I realize that everybody wants to move at light speed. And if that's what you want, fine, God bless you. Go sit there and try to drive your race car in the ocean. I, I, in, in the deep, dark, murky, no sunlight ocean. It, it, it does take a smart media buyer and an insightful media buyer. This is why AI is never going to fully replace the media buyer, because this is an insight where, all right, I'm planting the corn in the spring and I'm harvesting in the fall. All right. So I got to plant that corn in the spring if I want popcorn, uh, you know, around Christmas time. Right. Yeah. So this is where you would need AGI. Like once we have AGI, I think the media buyer is in trouble. But until then, the in-app AI can't. You're absolutely right. And to the point that I think you're making here, it requires a media buyer who's no longer myopic in scope. Yeah. You can't have, and dude, here's what's really funny. I own a Google ads agency. Guess what we just did? We just started offering all channels. Yeah. Because we had to. Yeah. Because if you only look at Google, you're effectively worthless. You you need somebody, and you guys have been doing this a long time. You need somebody who looks at post-click. You need somebody who's broader view allows them to really see like, oh yeah, I remember I planted last spring or whatever. When do you plant? Do you plant? I think fall? this spring. I'm not a farmer, I'm not a, but I'm, I'm not a sure. farmer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Warm in the spring. I have been through cornfields in August and they're, they're taller than a man, as they say. <clears throat> Depends on the man. Some men are taller than others. But um, bump. That is that is a yeah. great line from Braveheart. <laughs> um, the point is, is that I think you have to have those insights, and you have to kind of do some reverse reverse thinking. Yeah, and, dude, and you'll never be right. That's and you're never going to be right. And that's on, on my last call. I talked to a CMO of a of a massive organization mm -hmm. who knows for a fact what I'm saying is true, and still continues to report in app numbers. Yeah. Because that's all the board will accept. That's it's how he validates his existence. Because if he gives no. them like I don't know, he's out of a job. Yeah. So we get we get that. I think you also have to have an agency that understands that too. Is that right. there is a and bit then you're of playing this weird gerrymander game where it's like, yeah. all right, here's what it could be, and you can bring this to them, but you know, yeah. Yeah, but here's the real deal. But this is what right. I want you to present to the board next week. I know, yeah, exactly you know right. John does that for you. I know our CSOs do that for our clients 100% because there's never going to be an exact, like with 100% 100 certainty, we know exactly like this happens here and then this happens over here because humans are chaotic, right. literally. Dude, even where people, because people will say, well, ah, you know, I know that's true generally, but I'm in emergency plumbing. 
And in emergency plumbing, if somebody goes, I need a plumber right now today, I know for a fact that's last click and it's short term and it's not a buy long buying model. Here's what's crazy about it. I know somebody who runs an agency that only services home service, mostly plumbing. When he runs brand awareness campaigns and lets and puts people in front of, here's the logo, here's the brand, here's the URL, here's the phone number, here are the colors. Yep. And then when they do have, you know, hey, there's feces spewing out of my toilet. Even in that urgent situation, so the logo that I've seen before is more likely to get my click. So, so his true. brand awareness campaigns improve the efficacy of his last click emergency plumbing. So I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care how last click you think your shit is. Mm -hmm. You need to run top of funnel. You need to run full funnel. You need to run multi-channel. So true. So true. We have a client uh, It's in the electrical niche. And they advertise on Bruins games, on local Nesson, and they're electricians and they're huge. Yep. The point is, is like they are out there brand wise, but when you need an electrician and when something like your house is on fire or something like, I don't know, whatever your, the local electric emergency is, you know, something like your panel all of a sudden blows up. Like you think of those guys and you go do a brand search for them. It's not just electrician near me. There is the, the reason why they're spending all that money on TV ads on, you know, putting their name on the on the Bruins hockey rink, you know, superimposed, you know, or on the boards. And like they spend so much on all this brand stuff because they are exactly like what you're talking about. Like when you need them, you need them in a pinch. Yep. You need them now. And they're a name that you recognize. And their name you trust because the name you trust. Is, consumers aren't stupid. Even if I am being electrocuted in the moment, I still want to make sure that the person coming is competent. Correct, because I've seen their ads a hundred times. Yeah, like how many impressions they've gotten on me, you know, for the next time I need an electrician. Although, right. you know, I have a local electrician. But the point is, that I know their name off the top of my head because I see right. their stuff all the time. So it's not just for the plumbers and you know the people that are in need of the urgent thing right here and now. This is everybody in general. Uh, so, well, this has been tremendous. And I think, like, like I said at the beginning of this, I don't think it's hyperbole in saying that this is one of the more important, if not the most important, are we calling it a presentation concept? concept I think yeah, to, dude, this is to my understand, because, yeah. you know, and this is going back to, we have 10, 15 years of Google and Meta now advertising where we're all spoiled, where we could track basically everything at one point in time. We're pretty damn close to it. Yeah. And now it's gone back to there is, you know, th there is gray area. You know, there is obscurity. Mostly gray area. And it's mostly gray area when, you know, we try to think that it's actually, it's mostly black well, dude, and white. In fairness, in fact, it's, it's mostly, mostly opaque. Black. Yeah. yeah. It's mostly like you can't see shit. Yeah. Until, you know, the last seven days with these couple of channels at the bottom of the funnel. Yeah. It's one cube on a thousand cube Rubik's cube. The the interesting thing and last note here is that the stuff that you're talking about way, way up at the top of the funnel, and yes, we have been talking about this for years, is the cheapest traffic. Dude. It's well, not cheapest. just that. Not only is it the cheapest, but it makes everything else throughout everything your funnel else cheaper. Work, yes, it yeah. lowers your overall blended CPA all the way down. My TNC multiple. presentation, like we did this branding, we ten x to our brand spend on on Facebook, and we lowered the CPA like a hundred percent, like fifty percent, and then another fifty percent. The more we did at top of funnel. So yep. it makes everything cheaper, not just the traffic that you're buying at the top, which is non-conversion traffic. So um, anyway, it's we will come back to this theme, I think, a lot in 2024 because I don't think we can talk about it enough because I think people don't want to hear it necessarily, but this is the way of the world right now. So, um, Dude, I, you know, people don't want to hear it. That's fine. It's okay. We'll keep it talking is. about it. It just is, you know? It is. Yeah. I, for a very long time, didn't want to hear about safe sex. You know, I'm a 16-year-old boy, and I, I've got some ideas in my head, Ralph, but it's just like, man, if you don't want AIDS, you know what I mean? Like, this just is. Like, you, you have no rascal. choice but to opt in or go get digital AIDS. So. <laughs> That's true. That's true. You get, there's no, yeah. 
there's no uh, vaccine for this. Do we even go down there? There's no, there's no there's, yeah. prophylactic there's just, for this. There's just, yeah. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know, man. You're it's just like going to catch it no matter what, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. All it's right. it's that movie. Don't look up. You oh know, my God. People that don't want to hear about movie. that. Yeah. They're just oh like, God. just don't look just, yeah. I'm like, all right, well, we're leaving that link in the show notes. People have to go watch that movie. So that is such a good movie. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, right. The best well, part of that movie is how much Jonah Hill's character is not at all a parody. And it's just like what every politician's kid is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. It's so true. Yeah. Well, all right. Don't look up. Uh, you know, the meteor is actually coming. <laughs> In fact, oh, dude, it's probably- we've been, it's yeah. been exploded. That's yeah. It. It's it exploded already hit. It already yeah, hit. 18 months ago. And now we're yeah. like, Picking through the pieces. Yeah. Yeah. The KT line is there. Like, we're not extinct as the dinosaurs were, but, you know, it, attribution, as we know, it is certainly as extinct as it, we knew it 10 years ago. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Uh, so make sure that you do go over to our, our YouTube channel and watch this, uh, both both part one and part two. Super, super important for everyone who has been listening to the show for any period of time. We're obviously making uh, a lot of jokes about it, but it is what it is. This is digital marketing in 2024, and it's not going to change anytime soon. It's not going to get less opaque. So you might as well just, just uh, unless somebody can figure out how to track a view uh, and an impression in some third-party tracking software, which is well, not happening as of yet. In every single channel across in every single channel, the entirety tra- of a timeline that it takes somebody to right. convert. I, I'm just yeah. speaking like in the digital space. If you could right. do that, that would be quantum leap forward. But like you're never going to capture like how do you capture a billboard view, you know, or right. a newspaper view. Point is, is like this is the reality of what we live in right now. So make sure that you do subscribe and leave a rating. Let let us know what you think about today's show and uh, part one. Here we did go a little bit long here today. Obviously, let us know we, what we can do better over perpetualtraffic.com forward slash better like I said, subscribe, leave a rating. We uh, read them all. We read them on the air. We've read a few just in the last couple of weeks. And uh, obviously all the resources and show notes, everything that we mentioned here, movies that we want you to see, uh, conspiracy theories that you want you to, to adopt, uh, will all be over at perpetualtraffic.com. So on behalf of my awesome co-host, Qasem Aslam, peace. Until next show, see ya.